Hi, I'm Dr. Jeff Nickel, and I have the Nickel family border collie here, Miss America, and we have Gaston, and we have Tony, and they're just here because, you know, they like these events. <laughs> this is not about cats. This is about dogs. And just to give you a tiny bit of background, in case we haven't met, I'm a veterinarian, and I am residency trained in veterinary behavior medicine. In fact, after many years in general practice, I am now exclusively seeing pets with behavior disorders. And recently, we have had occasion to discuss post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, in pets. So I'm not going to make this too difficult, but this is an important problem. It's not real common, but it isn't rare either. So if anybody has any comments, for by all means, interject them type them in and you can interrupt me with anything anytime throughout this Facebook Live and I'll be happy to address any concerns. But if you like what you're experiencing or you know want to invite a friend or just make a little comment, you can hit the wow or the heart button or anything else. Um, comments, anything else, uh, just fine by me. So, intense fear. There's a lot of pets, cats and dogs and horses and other species, dogs in particular, who experience intense fear. Again, they don't have PTSD in every case, but these are profound reactions. And in fact, nightmares can be a big problem for some of these pets. And if you're familiar with PTSD in humans, you're going to see some parallels. This is a problem that has been much better researched in humans than it has been in pets. But we understand it in part because we have modern brain imaging nowadays, like fMRI scans and and uh, and, and uh, uh, PET scans, and these things are highlighting areas of the brain that are involved in these in these problems. Um, so I, I'm going to start out with um, just reading a, a definition. This is an official definition, if you will, of PTSD. It's an extreme reaction of intense avoidance, escape, or anxiety associated with the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. This is a part of the nervous system that most of us don't really need to think about. Autonomic, it's autonomous. In other words, it operates sort of on its own. Um, and uh, there's one branch of it, the parasympathetic side, that has to do with just mundane, all the time operations of the body, like automatic breathing, automatic heart rate, uh, the kinds of things going on in the intestine that we never have any reason to think consciously about. But the other side of it, the sympathetic side, that's largely driven by adrenaline, and it is the fight or flight response. It happens in about a half second. That's the trans uh, transition transmission time between different areas of the brain. And so when a, an event has put this problem into motion in somebody, it is a major intensely frightening event. Very often it's physical trauma, but it can be intense emotional trauma, or both. And these creatures, if they encounter something that comes along that has a pretty clear similarity to that original event, then they relive the entire uh, just overwhelming trauma all over again. And it can be a lifelong, um, real difficult problem. So. Sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system in response to a situation that the individual was unable to avoid or from which escape was impossible when the original trauma was felt. Repeated exposure to any aspect of the original circumstance, including memory of the original event, results in a consistent reaction. And, you know, it's hard sometimes with non human creatures to. You know, get all the answers that we need. Uh, our uh, our colleagues in human psychiatry have have an advantage over us for sure because they can get real clear answers from their patients. But what happens in humans, and we have very clear anatomic and neurophysiologic similarities, so we have some business uh, making some some educated assumptions that uh, when a pet or a dog in particular recognizes something that is uh, that triggers the old event. They endure the same thing, including a memory. So I'd like to also read a, uh, a question that came in um, from my newspaper column. And in fact, it came in through Facebook. But I have a weekly col column in the Albuquerque Journal, Question and Answer. And I uh, answer these questions when people send them to me on Facebook. 
but also I put them in the newspaper. So anyway, this is how this question went. We have a golden retriever that was given to us when he was a year and a half old. In his previous life, he was taken to two classes, two different classes, where he was subjected to fear and pain through a shock collar. Now, we don't support that kind of thing. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. A point that's important, though, is that there are some dogs, just like some people, with a genetic predisposition for developing PTSD. If you uh, participate in or are involved at the receiving end of the horrors of war, there are some individuals who, you know, bounce back and they go through life without a problem. But somebody, a human or a dog, who is genetically predisposed to having PTSD, those are the individuals where the same event causes them this lifelong problem. And you really don't know who you are until this is triggered. And when this, is, when this starts to occur in a dog or a person, it's just like a light switch being flipped that can't really be flipped off very easily. But we'll talk about treatment. So not every dog who's shocked ends up this way, but once you have, uh, once you've set this thing into motion, it's real hard to turn it back. So something that is truly painful and traumatic shouldn't be trying it in the first place. And ever since we have had him 15 months, he's had terrible nightmares where he screams at the top of his lungs in fear. They occur three to eight times per month. Otherwise, he's a great dog and a very happy during his waking hours. Is there anything we can do to eliminate the night demons that give him nightmares? So my response was that I'm really sorry that your excellent dog was treated so badly. I, uh, I feel like if I, can, if I can be really effective in spreading real valuable information about pets and their well-being, that maybe I can diminish the frequency of this kind of stuff. But force and intimidation have no place in humane treatment uh, or in current learning theory. These methods are unnecessary and badly outdated. Inappropriate behaviors can be frustrating. And, and frankly, you know, people try whatever they can think of, whatever their friends suggest, or whatever well-meaning dog trainers recommend. Um, and they feel like they've tried everything, when in fact, they haven't tried everything. Um, and they get frustrated, and people tend to resort to punishment. And punishment uh, is the treatment of choice in, in many people's hands because it's quick, and it requires no assessment of underlying causes. And of course, in the hands of people without postgraduate training in behavior, um, or like myself with a residency or a person with a PhD, if you don't have that understanding of what you're working with, you don't even know what to look for. But uh, the problem is that it often goes wrong. As much as it can work fast, it often has a much worse effect. For example, some dogs who are punished become defensive aggressive. Um, and so the person administering the punishment is actually at risk. Um, but while a dog can learn quickly what not to do, the problem with punishment is there's never anything about it that tells the dog or cat or person what to be doing instead of the punished behavior. Well, there's a motivation behind everything any of us does, including our pets. And if we don't address the motivation and steer it in a different, healthier direction, and all we're doing is coming down hard when the behavior occurs that we don't want, what the heck are they supposed to do instead? And we're not telling them, and they're not clear. So repeatedly inflicting pain can result in what's called learned helplessness. This is a behavioral term. It, an otherwise intelligent creature finally quits making any attempt to escape or defend itself and just takes it. Wow. This happens to people. It can happen to cats and dogs can happen to horses, laboratory animals involved in behavioral research can be a problem there. Learned helplessness is something that you have to understand what it looks like and do everything you can not to let anything like that happen. So if you avoid aversive punishment like electric shock, you're not going to have that problem and you're not going to have uh, be uh, triggering uh, PTSD with it either. So I went on to point out that your retriever's night terrors may be a direct result of his severe punishments. PTSD is an illness of humans that can occur in anyone who has experienced a traumatic event. Dogs are also known to suffer its unrelenting effects. And it can be unrelenting unless we really step in and work very carefully to uh, undo the damage. So I pointed out that there was a recent placebo-controlled study in humans 
that found that the oral medication Prazosin, P-R-A-Z-O-S-I-N, been around for quite a while, uh, had been used very commonly to treat high blood pressure. And in fact, I have prescribed it many times for treating hypertension in dogs and cats with heart disease and kidney problems where it's been indicated. We have newer medications now. But the stuff is still quite safe and pretty darn good. And what they've done with people is that they found that with uh, individuals who suffer with PTSD, and they take uh, prazosin at uh, gradually increasing doses given at bedtime, ending up at fairly high doses, not because of high blood pressure, but because it blocks adrenaline. And so those people are less prone to these overwhelming nightmares that occur while they're sleeping. And so we don't have research in dogs using it for this purpose, but we have lots of research and experience using prazosin in dogs for controlling their blood pressure. So we know its effects, we know how it works, how the body eliminates it, and we know we can safely use it. And so when a dog like this golden retriever with his overwhelming nightmares where he wakes up screaming, um, it could be a very viable treatment. Um, I went on to point out that there's more to behavior medicine than science. Inflicting pain, pain on helpless creatures is just not good for the soul of who's ever meeting it out. Uh, we need kindness and we need consistency to enable real improvement in ourselves and in men's and women's best friends. You know, it takes longer, but it's sure worth it. So, if you suspect that your dog has PTSD, which this one, by the way, does not, <laughs> You, here are some of the symptoms, which, by the way, can overlap with some other problems. Some dogs, when they are exposed to the, the fear trigger that's related to their PTSD, will freeze, just not move. Sometimes with trembling, sometimes not. Some of them will hypersalivate. Many of them will scan, looking, hypervigilant, looking for the threat. Um, there are dogs who lick their lips, who, who hide. Um, who become asocial, who stop playing, uh, who may have a diminished appetite, weight loss, or even chronic diarrhea that is stress-related. Now, those behavioral symptoms can be related to lots of other behaviors, and it takes a specialist who's really skilled and understands how to weed through all this, but the history really matters. And this person who wrote this question in had this history of the previous owner having taken this dog to a to a training organization. It happens to be a franchised one that's nationwide. And uh, they give these folks just a little bit of training and stuff that gets to the result people want or think that they want very quickly. So be very careful where you get your help and your advice. So what if you have a dog with a sleep disturbance? Well, there are things that need to be considered that are not PTSD. A good example is dogs who are uh, elderly and they develop dementia problem called cognitive dis, uh, dysfunction syndrome, CDS, in dogs. Those dogs can just wake up during the night and have, get restless and fidget. If it's a problem that develops as the pet has become older, it's probably not PTSD. Um, but there are also internal problems, uh, difficulties with liver disease, uh, stomach intestinal disorders, adrenal diseases, things like this that can interrupt sleep. Um, and of course, head injuries. I don't necessarily have to cause PTSD, but if a dog's been hit by a car, for example, and had a severe head injury, then long-term scarring in the brain, not just short-term symptoms, but long-term, this kind of stuff can develop. Um, and of course, brain tumors and other lesions. So we sometimes have to do a very in-depth uh, neurologic evaluation, and in some cases, it can involve an MRI to make sure we don't have an internal uh, brain lesion. So these things can be a little bit difficult to diagnose, but again, with a real clear history like this golden retriever, we have strong reason to be uh, suspicious. So what do we do with this thing? Well, you know, you don't want a bad problem to get worse. Or as I think it was Mark Twain said, when you find yourself in a hole, the first thing to do is stop digging. So, or maybe that was Will Rogers, somebody a little bit, been around a long time. Um, and so if you have a dog who's, who you can identify particular triggers that causes the dog to have extreme distress, well, it's a smart idea to start writing those down and be very clear about them so that you can avoid, make sure that your dog avoids those things. Whatever it takes in the ways that you manage him or her, what your dog is exposed to, 
try as hard as you can not to let that reoccur. Because when we allow the brain to rehearse these ramp ups in arousal and in response to a particular stimulus or trigger, the brain being a plastic organ, in other words, it can change anatomically and neurochemically permanently. We rehearse these things. It's like an athlete or a musician or a dancer or somebody who's might have some God-given talent and rehearses and rehearses and rehearses. Well, practice makes perfect. And you know, this problem isn't something we want the dog to get more, if you pardon the term, skilled at. In other words, you know, fine-tune the response. We want the dog to abandon it. So it's really important to avoid every possible trigger that we can of these things. Um, and you can desensitize, but it's an extremely slow process. And the mistake some people make is that they believe that if they continue to expose the dog to this thing, that he'll work his way through it, or that she'll, you know, if it doesn't kill her, it'll make her stronger. Um, boy, this is a neurologic dysfunction in the brain, and we just do not play those games. These pets do get sicker, and so it becomes extremely important that if we're going to say, look, if this dog's going to live some semblance of a normal life, then things that are suggestive of the triggers of the PTSD are going to occur. So can we reduce the dog's sensitivity? And the answer is yes. But the exposures to that type of trigger need to be at a very low intensity. In fact, probably intensity is the wrong word. The dog needs to notice it from a distance and show no indicators that it bothers the dog. So when the dog sees this thing, whatever it might have been, um, and of course this uh, golden retriever is never going to see a shock collar again, but if it gets exposed to it, it needs to be at such a low, low level, at such a distance, that the dog recognizes that, yeah, I see it, but it doesn't bother me. And if you do it at a high enough intensity that the dog gets nervous and it pants or fidgets or licks its lips or scans or yawns, another sign of anxiety, you've pushed it too hard too fast and you need to back up. It can take hundreds if not thousands of repetitions and finally increase the intensity of the stimulus or how close the dog is to it and then repeat hundreds or thousands of times and very, very slowly diminish the sensitivity. And frankly, most people don't have that kind of time, but it can be done. One of the things I like to do to help a dog through a problem that may that may be triggering some kind of angst, and this can be used with storm phobias or dogs who are nervous around unfamiliar people, is something called Tellington Touch, T-E-L-L-I-N-G-T-O-N, or often called T-Touch. It was developed by a lady named Linda Tellington. I believe it was used initially in horses, but it can be done in dogs. And if you go to my Facebook page and you send me your email address, I will send you some information on T-Touch. I've got a great handout on it. But it amounts to movements on the side with your hand, usually using a couple of fingers, making a circle on the side of the dog's chest. And you do it very slowly and consistently with just slight firmness, and you just do this repeatedly. You can also pinch a little bit of the skin very gently, and you can do that. And there is a neurologic response to that. Um, and it feels good to me, and it feels good to Miss America too. Then those kinds of things can make a difference. And I, frankly, I like to ask pets to earn that sort of thing. In other words, if I tell her to sit and she sits for me, then I immediately reinforce with this. And the value of the sit and earning this is that I'm redirecting her energy away from the, um, the trigger. And I'm refocusing her attention on her leader. So I give her a command and she does it. And if she is too nervous to do it, I give her a little push down on the rump, help her to succeed. And then she goes ahead and does that. And I tell her she's good and that I can uh, carry out the T-Touch. So again, if you're interested, you're very welcome to, uh, to send me your email address and I'll send you some more information. Some cases are pretty severe and uh, medication can make a difference. Medication should never be considered a last resort. It is sometimes a very important and essential component in helping somebody get well. Um, these things aren't necessarily important lifelong. It really depends on the case. But a benzodiazepine like alprazolam 
which is classically used for panic type disorders, can be particularly helpful. But some of these dogs also do well on, in addition, uh, once daily anti-anxiety medication like fluoxetine. Um, and finally, I want to tell you a little bit about something else that you can do if your dog is a little bit nervous. I don't care whether it's a exposure to an old PTSD trigger or whatever, but a food puzzle. And this is one of many kinds. There's a website called Nina Otterson, Otterson, pardon me. Uh, that's N-I-N-A, and her last name is O-T-T-O, like Otto, S-O-N. And uh, just NinaOtterson.com. And she's got lots of these different food puzzles. This is one of them. And the way it works is that you put, you put food in here and in these different, uh, put it in the little trap door, and you put it in each one of these things. And then you give the, uh, give the top of it a little twist. And what the dog has to do is raise the lid, and if she can't get the food out, she's got to push this thing around and get the food out, and then she's got to go over here and get another one. And, you know, with, particularly with older dogs with dementia, we do this to keep their brain sharp. Um, and, you know, it's interactive. You do it with your pet and they can work for their food, which is much like what's essential to a free living dog who, yeah, they'll eat what they kill, but you know, they have to, they have to search for carrion sometimes and figure out how to get it. Other food toys like a, like a twist and treat like this is something you can put canned or dry food in and they can work on this thing. And I like this twist and treat in particular because once you put the food inside, and again, I prefer it with, with canned food, you put that inside and <clears throat> And initially, you can make it pretty darn easy for the dog to get it out of there. And then if they get pretty good at it later, you can screw it together a little more and make it more challenging. Now, I have a couple of questions. Let me get close enough to read them. Richard, I uh, picked up a rescue that loses her wits caused by fireworks. Ah, uh, yeah. Now, could we debate that that may be a PTSD situation? Well, I'll tell you, a dog who has fear of fireworks, and many of them, they hear it in a distance the very first time in their lives and they're trembling and they're nervous and they want to find a place to get under and hide out, a den-like situation, be close to their person, that sort of thing. That's pretty common. But if you've got a dog who really freaks out, then it's possible that earlier that dog got exposed to super loud, super bright, overwhelmingly fear-provoking fireworks for that individual. The dog sitting right next to it might have had little or no problem, but that may be a PTSD situation. And um, the very first thing I would suggest to you, Richard, is that you, um, is that you avoidance. So number one, you know, July 4th, um, depending on where you live here in Albuquerque, we have the balloon fiesta every year in October, and we happen to live near the balloon fiesta park. <laughs> well, they have fireworks just about every night. Well, that's a problem if, if you live nearby and your dog gets just totally freaked out by it. Um, we have a, a minor league baseball team here in Albuquerque, and the folks who live near the ballpark, they have fireworks there after the ball games. And some of those dogs have a big problem. Well, this can be pretty challenging. I mean, do you have to sell your house and move? Um, you know, if, if, if it's something where it just occurs on big holidays, you could put your dog in a boarding kennel uh, or maybe have a friend look after it who's not going to... Uh, be exposed to those kinds of sounds. Avoidance really matters. Um, there are such things as a thunder cap. You can, it's uh, made by the thunder shirt people. You can look that up on the internet. They're about 20 bucks and it's this little, it's like a blindfold um, that, dim that diminishes the dog's ability to see things in the distance, such as the flashes of lightning for storm phobic dogs or fireworks in a, ca a case like your dog. And there's another product that many people think this is kind of humorous, but this is a wonderfully high quality made product that has made a very big difference for some dogs called Mutt Muffs, M-U-T-T-M-U-F-F-S. They look much like the ear muffs that people wear in the cold weather, but they also have a strap under the dog's chin. They come in different sizes and they fit very well and they're really well tolerated by most dogs. And they are quite good at significantly diminishing the sound. So those things can be helpful. There's a prescription gel that your veterinarian can dispense called Cilio, S-I-L-E-O. It's a gel placed between the lower lip and the gum. And in 20 minutes, the dog gets a mild dose of an anti-anxiety medication um, that does not cause sedation, 
but it is specifically indicated for noise phobias, and we have found that to be really helpful. I don't suggest people just pick one of these and try it, especially in a dog like yours, Richard, that really freaks out. You want to put everything to, into play ASAP to try to get your arms around this thing right away. And so I would do all that stuff, most importantly avoidance. Um, dogs need to uh, get into an interior room like a, like a walk-in closet uh, with no exterior windows, uh, white noise machines, uh, music that's uh, calming, music that's scientifically developed for dogs called through a dog's ear can be very helpful. But some people use an old-fashioned box fan that makes a lot of racket. I mean, you know, it's just a, you know, like an old propeller plane. Uh, those kinds of things will help draw, drown out the sound as well. Um, but yeah, avoidance, that really matters. There are behavior techniques, by the way, to desensitize dogs to sounds of fireworks. Um, again, you can do it, but it is so tedious and time consuming that simple avoidance and sometimes orally administered prescription anti-anxiety medications that are, that are meant for as needed use, not just the gel that I mentioned, but others can be uh, very safe and used uh, in combination. In cases like your dogs, I do whatever it takes to get my arms around the problem and give the dog relief right away, not just for its well-being, but because if we allow this thing to repeat, these problems get worse. So we, take, uh, we get after those things right away. So I hope this kind of thing has been helpful to everybody and, and you've enjoyed the antics of Tony and, and Gaston and Miss America, who's not upside down right now. She's sitting right next to me. And I invite everybody to uh, go to my website. There's frankly a wealth of information there. Um, and there are links to my videos. Um, and of course, you can subscribe, there's no charge. And if you sign up uh, every Tuesday morning, you'll get my weekly uh, newspaper column. And you'll also get my Facebook Live from the previous week. And often I make other videos, other blogs that I add in there as well. Uh, come right to your email box and when you sign up, You'll get, uh, at no charge, you'll get my at-home pet first aid and CPR guide, which I think keeping that kind of stuff handy, you never know. So thank you for watching. And uh, Miss America enjoys these things, Gaston and Tony. They get little snacks here. They hang out. We have a nice time pretty much every Thursday. Have a great evening.